Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Lahayam 2020. We're so glad you are here with us in our first ever virtual fundraising event of the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center. Now, like our previous events, we have a wonderful program for you this afternoon. But first, we have an extremely important message to hear from an outstanding world leader. I invite you to listen closely to her timely message created specifically for us. Please join us in welcoming former United States Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. Good afternoon. I am pleased to introduce this event in support of the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center. This institution is a labor of love, a shrine to knowledge, and an enduring testament to the resilience of the human spirit. It also embodies the need for continued vigilance because the Holocaust proved that what should be unthinkable is not truly beyond thought and that if we are complacent, the inconceivable can happen over and over again. About 3,000 years ago, after the death of his father, King David, King Solomon prayed as a servant or as a child might, not for glory and riches, but for the ability to tell the difference between evil and good. This challenge can be complicated which is why Solomon was praying. To me, the answer begins with the knowledge that every life is sacred and that the fate of each individual should matter to us all. It is true that the peoples of the world differ in language, ethnicity, customs, history, and faith. But as the Holocaust reminds us, we must never allow the distinctions that define us to obscure the common humanity that binds us. We must never allow pride in us to curdle into hatred of them. Heeding that lesson is what every effort at Holocaust education is all about. And it is a mission that is more important now than ever. It is about understanding and accepting that no one's blood is less or more precious than our own. There are those who view the Holocaust as the freakish consequence of a single demented mind. Others attribute it to the characteristics of a particular culture. Still others point to the passing decades and ask whether it is not the time to forget and move on. And as we know, there are some who deny it ever really happened at all. In reply, we must admit that we do not have the power to change human character, but we do have the power of memory. We have the power of reason and can separate truth from lies. We have the power of prayer and can hope in the words of the Psalms for a time when truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. And we have the power to choose. 
we can contemplate the Holocaust and despair, or we can remember the Holocaust and vow never again to allow complacency, fear, or despair to excuse inaction. We can make certain that the dead shall never be forgotten from our hearts. We can share the testimony of survivors, including those who enriched the life of communities across Alabama. That is the most we can do. That is the least we must do. It is what we owe to the past. It is our hope for the future. And in the largest sense, it is the hope of the world. So thank you for your support of this extraordinary organization. And please join me in welcoming Juna Given from the Red Mountain Theater Company singing Hope, written by Tony Award winning composer Jason Robert Brown. Thank you. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and RMTC artist Juna Given. Thank you for giving La Haim a spectacular opening. Our community, our nation, and world are challenged by COVID-19, hate on the rise, and growing economic insecurity. Now more than ever, it's crucial for us to be reminded to look for hope. We're challenged by you to move through times of darkness and despair and create opportunity. No stranger among us, David Silverstein is a local leader who makes it his practice to create opportunity. He is also one of our Lahayim 2020 
honorees. David is deeply committed to Holocaust education. He and his wife, Susan, want everyone, especially students and their teachers, to study and learn what it means to be an upstander to hate and injustice. David, we thank you for reaching out to Secretary of State Albright and Coach Bruce Pearl to invite them to Lahayim this time around. Our gratitude also to your friend and friend of the BHEC's Lahayim events, Keith Cromwell, Executive Director of Red Mountain Theater Company and Creative Director Drew Francis for both of their leadership and their creative work. Lahayim 2020 would not be successful without the critical support from our sponsors. A big thank you to our presenting sponsor, Medical Properties Trust, for their generous contribution. And thank you to more than 25 corporate sponsors and more than 250 individual sponsors and contributors. For a full list of all of our sponsors, it's easy to find them along with the Lahayam presenters and musicians. Just check the online event program on the website. And now we have the pleasure, a distinct pleasure, of hearing from a remarkable local leader who had the vision to start the BHEC back in 2002, 18 years ago. She's incomparable in her energy and enthusiasm for Holocaust education. At 99 years of age, she still inspires us. Join me in welcoming our BHEC founder, Phyllis Weinstein, who has a special message for all of us. Dear friends, in 2002, when we began the Birmingham Holocaust Committee, we never dreamed that today, 18 years later, we would be welcoming such national guest speakers as Madeleine Albright and Bruce Pearl. We are honored. I am indebted to all the volunteers, the professional staff, and you and the many others who have contributed to our efforts throughout the years. Today, we honor David and Susan Silverstein, their deep devotion to ensuring the future of this organization deserves such an honor. Congratulations, David and Susan Laham. Thank you so much, Phyllis, who started this organization back at the tender age of, of 81. We are certainly honored by your message today, and we're inspired by your vision still. You saw an opportunity to create a new organization to share the powerful stories of our Birmingham Holocaust survivors and educate new generations and their teachers. We're indebted to you, and we certainly thank you, Phyllis. And now, please join me in welcoming our Lahayim 2020 Host Committee co-chairpersons, Kathy Friedman and Jim Richardson, who will give an update on our fundraising efforts after they take off their masks. We thank you to everyone who has made a contribution so far. And remember, folks, this is a fundraiser to support the vital work of the BHEC. Help us move the total that you'll see on your screen upwards all day. Kathy? Thank you, Jeff. We're so honored to have you as our Lahaim MC this year and so grateful for the wonderful media sponsorship of WVTM 13. An important fact is that all BHEC programs are free and available to everyone. Today, help us continue our work to teach the history and the lessons of the Holocaust by making your contribution. We can't change the past. We can change the future with education. It's easy to support the BHEC. Just click the donation, Donate button on the right side of your screen, and a small window will appear. You can give as much as you would like. Next, you can say hello to your friends over here in the chat box. Even though we can't be together in the same room, we can use this time to support each other while we support the BHEC. And remember, when you give during this live event, your thank you shows up on the screen. 
any contribution amount is important, no matter the size. Your giving voice will never be as loud as it is here today. You're part of the groundswell of support for Holocaust education across the greater Birmingham area and around Alabama. Thank you to our donors, including presenting sponsor Medical Properties Trust and all our corporate and individual sponsors and contributors. We are also very excited to honor our friends Susan and David Silverstein today. I've known Susan and David for many years, and I know you will enjoy getting to know them as I have. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for all that you've done for this year's event. I would like to share with you our fundraising totals for this year's Lahayam event. As you can see, we have raised over $333,000, which is fantastic. However, we would love to see the total go even higher during the course of the event. Message your friends and family. Ask them to make a donation. Uh, if they've already donated, ask them to increase their donation. Uh, you may also want to text and give. It's very simple. Just text LAHIAM, L-C-H-A-I-M, to 41411. Again, L-C-H-A-I-M to 41411, and make your contribution there. As I said, it's very simple. But regardless, we want to thank you so much for your support of BHEC, our mission of uh, Holocaust education, and, uh, and helping to apply the lessons to others so that future generations will build a more accepting and welcoming community for all. Every dollar we raise increases the possibility of more students and teachers and all of us learning about the Holocaust. You know, of the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust, one and a half million, one and one half million were children. The Alabama survivors we know and love today experienced the excruciating horrors and trauma of the Holocaust as children. They were the victims of overwhelming hatred and cruelty just because they were Jewish. How does a child even begin to understand all this? How do Jewish children today, 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 process the ugly realities of anti-Semitism? Now, the following monologue, written by Deborah Lehman and performed by Kira Berger, explores these important questions. When the trouble started, I asked my parents why. I don't understand. I said, what have we done wrong? They looked at each other. I could see the pain in their eyes. After a long silence, my father answered, we've done nothing wrong. It's because we're Jewish. Because we're Jewish? What's wrong with that? I love being Jewish. I've always loved it. Family around the Shabbos table, the candles flickering, Papa's blessings, his hand on my head, Mama's chicken soup, golden braided challah, the prayers, the conversations, lessons really, about kindness and generosity. My good and gentle mama and papa. My aunts and uncles and cousins all together during the holy days and festivals that mark the seasons. Eating, singing, dancing, laughing, sweet clarinet, the melancholy violin. I love the stories my grandfather told us about our people of old. My good-hearted Jewish people, sometimes wise and brave and sometimes foolish, always with a lesson to be learned. Our rabbi, a wise and learned man, a kind man, 
I loved the synagogue that smelled of old books and polished wood, the prayers we sang every week, every holiday. I loved the deep, resounding voice of our cantor, the moment of anticipation as the ark is opened and the holy scrolls are revealed, wrapped in silk and velvet, crowned with silver just like a queen, ivory sheets of parchment on which the words of our story have been written by the scribes. I loved this. I loved hearing the words of our ancient language and then feeling their music in my own mouth. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Now, more than ever, I'm proud to be Jewish. Being Jewish is a good thing. We mean no harm. We honor God. We try to keep his commandments. What have we done wrong? I speak for all the children. We are taught to be good, to do good, to be kind, to care for others, to be repairers of the world. And when we do wrong, our parents punish us and correct us. This I understand. But now they hate us just because we're Jewish. They curse us with cruel faces and hateful words. They want us to suffer. They want us to die. They smash our homes. They take our fathers away. They pull us from our mother's arms. Don't they have families? Don't they have children? We're just children. What have we done wrong? I don't understand. Is evil stronger than good? How can this be so? We're taught that this is not so. And yet, all around me, I see evidence of evil that I could have never imagined. No lessons have prepared me for this. I have seen children wasting away. I've heard them cry out for their mothers in anguish. I have seen them die. Who will punish the evildoers who take away every comfort from the children? This, this is wrong. We're bereft. We're frightened, we're hungry. Why are we being punished? Tell me, please, what have we done wrong? Why? Thank you, Kira Berger, Red Mountain Theater Company, and Deborah Lehman, author of that powerful monologue, an open-ended question. Deborah is a BHEC board member and certainly saying hello to her today. A couple of uh, quick thoughts uh, for you now. One of the great joys of my life thus far has been meeting three of the Alabama survivors among the precious 12 or 13 still living here. Max, Reva, and Ruth had the pleasure of meeting them about this time last year. Their horrible childhoods propelled their courage and their internal inspiration, internal inspiration for us all. You know, lately, as I think about the terrible plague on all of our houses, the COVID-19 cases, five million strong now here in America, five million people who are sick or have been made sick by something over which there is no control. I think today of the six million of our people who died taken by man-made cruelty. There will be a vaccine for COVID mighty soon. In the meantime, we are the vaccine against hatred now. It's been 75 years since World War II ended and 40,000 concentration camps and ghettos were liberated at last. Our beloved Alabama Holocaust survivor stories remind us of the power of hate and fear generated by the Nazi regime. Their stories of survival also generate 
transformative experiences for all of us here in Birmingham, and for that matter, across Alabama. More than 100,000, 100,000 students and teachers have learned about the Holocaust through the power of our Holocaust survivors' memories and their critical stories. The survivors are now in their twilight years, as we well know. Only a few are able to speak to schools and groups. And thankfully, the BHEC has recently digitized their testimonies. For all time, and volunteer transcribers have been busy at work all summer under the leadership of BHEC archivist and librarian Rachel Jones Lopez. In addition, our Darkness Into Life exhibit featuring 20 Alabama survivors is available to travel to your group. You may learn more anytime on the BHEC website. And now we have a very special guest from our state who's an outstanding leader on and off the basketball court. He's also a friend and supporter of the BHEC. Please join me in welcoming Auburn University men's head basketball coach Bruce Pearl and special interviewer Tricia Skelton, BHEC Holocaust educator and teacher at Opelika Middle School. Coach Pearl, it's an honor to interview you today during L'Chaim. Uh, thank you for being with us and for sharing your thoughts about the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center and the importance of Holocaust education. At first, as an Auburn fan, as a teacher, War Eagle, I, I appreciate your leadership and the approach to all that you do. The COVID-19 pandemic has been hard on all of us, and I know you and the team have experienced a different kind of season. What has been the most challenging for you as a leader, and what positive outcomes have surprised you during this pandemic and our new reality? Well, it's great to be with you, and thank you for what, you're, what you do as a teacher. Oh, thank uh, for you. The, uh, BHEC. Um, these are different times, so we've never really we've never really navigated, um, uh, been through this before. Everything kind of got put on hold. A lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, adversity. It it not only builds character, but it reveals it. So I try to get my players to be at their best when things were at their worst. Well, things weren't very good back in March, when the NCAA sure. tournament got closed and the SEC tournament ended and. All of a sudden, something you work for your whole life is over and you can't compete for a championship. Our guys handle it like champions. Um, and uh, I'm just confident that we're going to navigate through this and uh, we're going to get through it like we always do. Yes. The BHEC has experienced a lot of change as well during the pandemic. They've moved all their programming online and they've actually had record attendance. Great. As a classroom teacher in Opelika, I've been making a lot of adjustments as well to prepare uh, school for the, the fall. In the midst of all the changes, all of us are aware of the uptick in anti-Semitism and racism in our country. But why do you think that perhaps now more than ever, we need teachers like me to teach students the history and lessons of the Holocaust? Well, I appreciate you asking the question and once again, appreciate you being one of our great teachers. Thank you. Look, education and exposure to different things, different people, uh, is what it's all about. And I grew up in 19, I was born in 1960. I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. I saw real racism. I saw forced busing. I saw incredible segregation. I was born 15 years after the gates opened when six million of my brothers and sisters were murdered because of the way they prayed. And three, other, three million other people were, were, were murdered in, in, because they were different. And uh, I couldn't understand why we saw the things that made us different and we were scared by them. And um, so much of it was a lack of exposure. And we can learn so much from our kids. Uh, but we grow older, we develop prejudices, we're ignorant sometimes because of a lack of exposure and, uh, and, and a fear of, of the unknown. I think the vast majority of us want it to be better. Mm -hmm. And that willingness for it to be better. So the answer is education. Mm -hmm. The answer is exposure. Um, I can't imagine how a classroom teacher from Opelika, Alabama, who's not Jewish, mm -hmm. would even begin 
to try to understand how to teach a class to sixth graders about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing? We're providing the education. We're training the trainers. We're providing the education to the teachers. And we're doing it in such a way where they're learning something that you may not have even been taught or certainly could not even comprehend or fully understand. Most of our teachers aren't Jewish. And so they, they can identify exactly with it the same way. The scholarship, the visibility, the exposure, the collaboration, the exchange of ideas. Look, I'd like to think that I do a decent job of teaching the game of basketball. The reason why we've been successful in, in, in small part, but in part, is because I had a great teacher in Dr. Tom Davis who taught me how to coach the game. Therefore, the answer is simple. We need to teach our teachers how to teach. One of the world's greatest tragedies of all time to children that have really never been exposed to it, have no idea what it's about, and then being able to relate it to things that they're going through right now in their own lives to be able to draw the connections for just what is possible. What I and other Holocaust educators teach is about the complexity, the complicity, and the collaboration of common citizens. This broad range of bystanders help make the Holocaust possible. The BHEC teaches about bystanders, and we also teach about the power and empowerment of what it means to be an upstander, to stand up to others against injustice and hatred against any group. What do you think that looks like today? How do you see upstanders at your job? And what personal wisdom would you give to young people about being an upstander? Wow. There's a lot, there's to, a there's lot. A lot to unpack <laughs> there. Um, I was 13 years old when my grandfather died, shortly after my bar mitzvah. He was only 63. And I remember um, he died in 1973. Six years earlier during the Six Day War, I watched the television with him, a little black and white, as you can imagine. And uh, he was a very strong man, a plumber. Uh, strong when I said he didn't show a lot of emotion. But I remember him watching the television every night during the war and crying and, and, and afraid to go to bed. And I'd say, Papa, why, why, why aren't we going to bed? He said, and he explained to me, six, I'm afraid that when we wake up, Israel won't be there. It'll be gone. Six years later, before he died, he made me promise him that the words never again would actually mean something to me. And I promised him that I would do the best I could so that it would never happen again, not just to the Jewish people, but to anybody. And that's the work that we're doing here. And on more than one occasion, on several occasions, with both children, I had parents that I'd never met that didn't know me that came up to me, introduced themselves, and said, your son, Stephen, sat next to my daughter in the cafeteria when she was being picked on. Or your daughter, Jackie, stood, uh, uh, stood in line with my son or, or, or broke up an altercation with my son who has got a, a handicap of some sort. I taught my children mm -hmm. to stand up mm -hmm. and to have a heart for those that are not as advantaged. Mm -hmm. It's important that, that we take advantage of these moments to see the social injustice that, are, that is out there and stand up and do something about it. Have we not seen the beatings in Selma? The Voting Rights Act in the 63, 64, 60 may never have passed when it did. We had to see it. We have to continue to see the Holocaust, see it, to believe it, that it could possibly happen. We have to see a police officer stand on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes to see that it could possibly happen and say, you know what, that is wrong. We can't have that in our, in our criminal justice system. We are better than that. And we work. Together, so the great, I think, opportunity we have right now is, as I said, and you mentioned it, look at all the other people, LGBT community, the poor versus the rich, the weak versus the strong, 
black versus white, we have an opportunity to tie this all together. Again, tie us all together in such a way where we just get our kids to be thinking about it and not be willing to stand by. Looking ahead to the year 2030, what do you think is most important about the BHEC and Holocaust education going forward? Well, I mean, just that, you know what? When I am in these situations where you ask how important is something, what I'm gonna ask everybody to do right now for one second is let's just pretend BHEC isn't an organization. In fact, it's never been. Holocaust education hasn't been taught in the state of Alabama. It's not going to be taught. Where, where would our kids be? Where would the educational process be? How bad would racism, anti-Semitism, and all this be without it? That's how you know how important it is. So through our efforts tonight and in the future, L'chaim, we're going to fund this program. We're going to make sure that our teachers are equipped to be able to tell the story and continue to tell the story. The great part of the story is the story of Passover and the fact that as we're taught to teach it to our children, that's what the Seder is, but it's about the storytelling. If we stop telling the story of the Holocaust over and over again, if we break one of God's commandments and stop teaching it to our children, we're, we're in trouble. We're in worse trouble than we are right now. I cannot think of a better way for us to make a difference than, than, than to continue to support this great cause. Yes, I agree. It's very important. Holocaust educators like me have received in-depth training from the BHEC, and they've given us scholarships to study in Eastern Europe and with other Holocaust educators at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and at the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous in New York City. I've been fortunate enough to receive several Freedman scholarships through this program, and it's allowed me to travel, and it's allowed me to collaborate with other educators, which is so important. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview you today, and thank you for helping us empower us to not only claim never again, but to decide every day for us to be an upstandard, so that no group endures what our beloved Alabama Holocaust survivors experienced in the concentration camps and other communities across Germany and Eastern Europe. Thank you again so much, Coach Farrell. I'm here to thank you. Thank you. And I'm here to thank all of you. Can't serve if you're not called. So I'm so blessed to be a, a part of this program. I never missed a parent-teacher conference. I have four children. That's a lot of parent-teacher conferences. And I really didn't go to those conferences to learn more about my child. I went to those conferences to look those teachers in the eye and thank them for loving my child and thank them for loving those children and making sure that they knew from my standpoint as a parent, and I guess as a fellow educator, coach, and teacher, how grateful I was. Tonight, we've got to support those teachers. Right now in development, given these times, these are difficult times, these are challenging times. Everybody's struggling with their fundraising, but this is something we can't cut a corner on. And just so you know, I. I you can't ask anybody to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. And my wife, Brandy, and I are now supporting this Holocaust education more so than ever. And I'm pledging to you tonight that I'm going to continue to be a generous donor so that we can put teachers like Tricia out into the community, put their hands and their arms and love on these kids and tell them, about one of the world's greatest tragedies. And to make sure that not only do the kids understand that this is, should never happen again, it should never happen again to anyone. On behalf of the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center, it is my distinct honor to recognize four outstanding Holocaust educators, three of whom are collaborating to write a new teacher workshop curriculum, each of them rise well above their regular classroom duties to study and to learn more about the Holocaust so that they can teach their students well 
and empower them to understand current realities of hatred and the indifferences that exist. So please join me in honoring Robbie Ballard of the Altamont School, Logan Green of Calera High School, Amy McDonald of Shades Valley High School, and Tricia Skelton of Opelika Middle School. It is their powerful work as teachers that are empowering new generations to build communities of tolerance and of acceptance. Thank you for your outstanding contributions to our community, to our state, to the schools, and most importantly, to the children. And now it is my distinct honor to introduce this year's L'Chaim honorees, Susan and David Silverstein. Their commitment to this movement and to the Birmingham community truly need no introduction. Now more than ever, we must continue the mission of the Holocaust Education Center. You know, there are very few organizations that mission is train teachers to talk to their students about the Holocaust. It was about five, six years ago that Susan and I were able to um, sponsor, along with the BHEC in St. Luke's Episcopal Church, we were able to sponsor Eva Kaur, a Holocaust survivor, to come speak at St. Luke's. And uh, Eva um, was in Auschwitz with her twin sister survived uh, the Holocaust um, and would tour the country speaking about the experience and about how, how she forgave. And once she forgave, it lifted a, a burden off her shoulders. But you could tell these students were touched, their soul was touched. They had never heard a Holocaust survivor. But it resonated with us that it's only through education that we can ensure that the next generation doesn't forget. I think the people that came to hear her speak were so blown away and enlightened of what had happened. So many didn't know about it and they went away being touched in their hearts. And this is what we need for the teachers to do to the children that are growing up. They're studying their history books, but they don't really understand what it was and what had happened. We received a phone call asking whether Susan and I would consider being the this year's honorees for Lachaim. And as usual, he said no. He says no every time someone wants to recognize the good work that David does. When I heard that my parents were being honored, uh, I felt humbled for them and for our family to be recognized. Dad has done a lot of work behind the scenes with fundraising and, um, you know, helping to coordinate speakers. You know, my parents have always um, done an incredible job of teaching us the importance of education and memory. Um, the stories and the suffering of the Jewish people and of all people around the world is something that cannot be forgotten. You know, I, 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 it's emotional because, you know, I don't want, you know, the next, my children. I want my children to understand what happened. And I want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And I, and I can only imagine, like I say, I can only imagine what it must have been like to have a knock on the door and watch your family taken away and put in a cattle car and taken to a camp to be exterminated. Mom and dad are kind of one of a kind. What drives me crazy about Susan is she's never wrong. You know, to, to live with somebody that, you know, you say, well, what would Susan do? Because I know that whatever she would suggest at that moment, um, would be the right course. Um, I, I, I'm, we're very blessed to have the relationship that we do. Parents' love for each other is something I've never seen before. It's like in movies. They met when they were 15. My dad fell head over heels for my mother. And they had five kids, and my dad is so in love with my mom. So is my mom, but my goodness, 
He calls her 20 times a day, always wants her by his side. The most ridiculous thing about my parents is something I'm envious of, and that is the amount of love they have for each other. The most about David is his kindness, his generosity, his wanting to help everybody out there. Um, so I uh, just reflect on what our virtual religious experience this summer has been with our church, um, and that is, it's been very fulfilling, and it's been focused on love. And thinking about that, it, of course, recalls the story of David meeting uh, Susan Stad for the first time as a 15-year-old, looking into the door as it opened as tall, white-haired, handsome um, Reverend Tilson opened the door and wondered why in the world he was there. It's in the commitment of this couple. Um, here David is at Vanderbilt. Uh, Susan's a year or two older or whatever, but um, through the four years of, of Vanderbilt, he would drive to Birmingham, pick her up, bring her to Nashville, celebrate the weekend, and drive her back, and then come back to Nashville. Y'all's selection of, uh, of Susan and David as the honorees, you hit it right on the mark. Um, they celebrate love every day with their family, uh, their children, and now, as Nancy said, their, their grandchildren. Y'all really did hit the mark. David and Susan, our family cherishes the relationships that we have developed with you and your children over the last 25 to 30 years. This recognition is so well deserved for you continue to work diligently in our community to make Birmingham a better place to live. The examples you have set for your children will live on for years to come. Thank you for all that you do. When we first heard that David and Susan would be honored tonight, we thought, what a great choice, because both of us understand how strongly both David and Susan feel about the work that you do. When David commits, he commits. And when I met Susan, it didn't take me long to understand the source of David's commitment and devotion. There's no better evidence of what kind of people they are than when you meet their five adult children who have grown into amazing people themselves. They not only love each other, but they really like and respect each other. To all of you, congratulations on your event tonight, and congratulations to David and Susan, whose generosity, including generosity of time and spirit, set a great example for a lot of people, including me and Amy. All right, lots of love in that room and in this one virtually. We are so glad to have you with us this afternoon. What wonderful honorees we have among us today. Please uh, join us in welcoming back to the podium Lahayam co-chairpersons Kathy Friedman and Jim Richardson. They have a special gift to share with our honorees this afternoon. Susan and David. How can we thank you enough for all that you do for us? You inspire us. You give us hope to continue spreading the BHEC's message of education and hope. In your honor, we have designed this special crystal award. You can see it on the screen. It says, L'Chaim 2020 honorees, Susan and David Silverstein, Thank you both for your tremendous support and friendship over these many years. I love you, Susan and David, and your big, wonderful family. Susan and David, <clears throat> my dear friends, we hope you're enjoying your watch party at home with your wonderful family. Thank you so much for your leadership and support of BHEC and all that you do to make our community such a better place. We'll make sure that you receive this small token of our appreciation, but even more, thank you for the impact that you have on our community. You truly inspire us. Thank you. 
Well, we certainly have lots to talk about here. You've been talking to us in our uh, chat alongside here, so we're so grateful for your kind and generous comments. And I have good news. We have raised almost $370,000, every nickel of which goes to making our world a better place, not only for us, but our children and our grandchildren and beyond. Lador Vador, from generation to generation. Now, please join me in welcoming my friend, the Executive Director of the BHEC, Reverend Melissa Self Patrick. Thank you so much, Jeff. You're a wonderful MC. It's great to have you here with us this afternoon. And thanks to everyone who is here on the live set. You've heard from nearly all of us, not quite. But we want to give a special, special thanks to all of you who have contributed tens of thousands of dollars, some in increments large, some small, and some in between. They make a huge ripple in our work and will continue to sustain and grow our work through Holocaust education and applying those lessons of building a more accepting and just community. We have some more numbers to share with you, some data over the last 10 years. It's been 10 years since we began our teacher workshops. And as you can see on your screen, um, this is the result of 10 years of work from Ann Mullingarden and all the four teachers you saw featured today and many, many other people, including our Holocaust survivors, a few of whom are still able to talk with groups, as well as the over 1,000, over 1,500 teachers who have been a part of our trainings and are a part of the groundswell of our work. I want to point out it's no small thing that over 98,000 students have experienced the history and the lessons of the Holocaust in their classrooms over the last 10 years. Even during COVID-19, as we moved all of our programs online, our teachers have been hard at work planning new curriculum for their online learning or in-person learning, depending on their school system, so that these powerful stories, these vital stories to our history um, don't go unrecognized. There is a lot of empowerment that happens through our work and now more than ever, we must preserve and share our Holocaust survivor stories. In the midst of this pandemic, I've had the opportunity to keep in touch with several of our Birmingham survivors by telephone and one with a brief visit hollering from the patio um, behind. And speaking of behind me, there are um, panels from our Darkness Into Life exhibit that tells the stories of 20 of our Alabama Holocaust survivors. It's available to view online at bhecinfo.org. And hopefully, once we make it to the other side of this pandemic, we can resume displaying our original exhibit of art and photographs in our soon-to-be new home. We'll let you know where that is when we know. It is a very special thing to be a part of the relationship building of the BHEC. Our fundraising relies on relationships. The power of what we do relies on relationships. And we want to continue to tell the stories of our survivors. In closing, I want to share with you briefly one of our survivors' writings, Ruth Siegler, who tells a story in her book, My Father's Blessings, about her and her sister's experience. With each other's help, Ilsa and I survived an incredibly difficult journey. In the camps, we always tried to stay in the background, never standing at the front of the line or at the very end, never any place where you might get noticed. Most importantly, we always maintained hope. That is what kept us going, the thought that maybe we would see our family again. Although I was not able to see them again after the war, vivid memories of my parents are always with me, even today. And Ruth is now in her 90s as well. She says, against all odds, 
our faith in the values and traditions that we had been raised so to cherish kept us alive. I now want to welcome to the podium one of our wonderful Holocaust educators, um, Amy McDonald, who over the course of the summer became one of our new uh, part-time staff members as well. Amy? Hi, I'm Amy McDonald and I teach at Shades Valley High School in Birmingham. I've been involved with the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center now for almost 10 years. The teacher scholarships I have received from the BHEC have provided opportunities which have been some of the most informative, enriching, and rewarding experiences with which I've ever been associated. Not only have these experiences broadened and deepened my knowledge of the Holocaust, they have emboldened and challenged me as an educator. The impact on my teaching has been far-reaching and definitely life-changing. I care very deeply about the about the BHEC and am passionate about Holocaust education. The BHEC has trained me, invested in me, believed in me, and embraced me. Because of the BHEC, I now bring more knowledge, more understanding, and more passion to the field of Holocaust education. My hope is that my students will carry these lessons of the Holocaust with them wherever they go throughout their lives. Now more than ever, we must continue to empower teachers. And as Coach Pearl just so powerfully said, we have got to equip our teachers to tell the story so that they in turn can teach the powerful message of never again. And now I'd like for us to welcome Joni Wiley, who is our still fairly new um, communications events and program coordinator of the BHEC. And I want to give a special shout out um, to her for all of her hard work behind the scenes with the SWELL team and also to Lauren Lambert, who is our finance and operations director and is definitely behind the scenes today receiving your generous contributions. Joni? Hi, I'm Joni Wiley, and now more than ever, we must engage more youth and young adults to take the lessons of the Holocaust and apply them to create a more just, humane, and tolerant future. Now more than ever, we must work together to create an accepting community. Here at the BHEC, we're doing this by increasing our social media presence and also adapting to the times by creating online programs as well as providing virtual resources. The BHEC is committed to, to the mission of educating the people of Alabama about the history of the Holocaust, and also steadfast in our mission to be an organization that promotes a moral and ethical response to prejudice, hatred, and indifference for the benefit of all of the community. Never again is not a mantra, it's a call to action. Thank you so much. And Joni, thank you. Thank you for being with us today, and now more than ever, supporting the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center. The BHEC remains focused on eliminating hatred from our world, a mighty big task, but we're up to it. Through the lens of the past and the eyes of those who bore witness to evil, we're educating a new generation, a generation versed in kindness, respect, and acceptance. Together we'll survive and we'll find hope for tomorrow. We must keep up the good work, stay the course, remain persistent and courageous. Please welcome back the incomparable Juna Given, once again accompanied by Christy Vest, as she reminds us all to have faith. We will all be here tomorrow and through the work of the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center, we can find strength and the hope to keep going on. We'll be here tomorrow, alive and well and thriving. We'll be here tomorrow, we know it's called surviving. If before the door, this fragile world might
won't crack. Someone's got to try and put the pieces back. So from beneath the rubble, you'll hear a little voice say, life is worth the trouble. Have you a better choice? So let the skeptic say, tonight we're dead and gone. But we'll be here tomorrow, simply going. Every day, a gift from God, and with God's help, we'll all be here tomorrow. What a magnificent voice. Thank you again, Juna Given, and accompanist Christy Vest. Also, very grateful to our outstanding speakers. Lots of people to thank now, so let me do that. Coast Bruce Pearl, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Our thanks uh, once again to Kira Berger, Deborah Lehman, Keith Cromwell, Drew Francis, and the Red Mountain Theater Company. A very special thank you to our presenting sponsor, Medical Properties Trust, and all our corporate and individual sponsors. Thank you, Karen Day and Ralph Lindstrom of Music Techniques, and gratitude to Brooke Battle and her team at Swell. Thank you to Kathy Friedman and Jim Richardson, our Lahayam co-chairpersons, along with Kate Cotton and the entire host committee whose names are listed on the event website. Some people are applauding here, but we're socially distanced. A little hard to hear us this afternoon. Remember, you can still give online right now, and this site will remain up for a couple of more weeks, I'm told. Let's get over maybe to $400,000. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You can text Lahayam for that purpose to 41411 or send your check to the BHEC. Post your comments and photos from the event on social media, too. We love to see you. Remember to share the BHEC story to help us grow, to grow our work, and to share our mission of building a more accepting and just community. Until we meet again, I'm Jeff Eliasoff, and as I sign off on the air most nights, please be safe and be well. And now a final word. Thank you for joining the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center for this powerful program. Now more than ever, I challenge all of us to join together with the center to create a more caring, just, and accepting community.